Hey guys, it's James, recording live from the homeless shelter. I'm coming today with another story. It's a pretty recent one. It's about uh, two new arrivals to the house. And we're going to call one country and the other slick. Two young guys, right? I met them um, about a week and a half ago. So about a week and a half ago, I'm outside of the building and I'm taking out my trash. And I meet young country, right? This, uh, this young guy, I think he's like 20, 21. He's tall, like 6'3 or something. I call him country because he loves country music. And in this very short interaction, out of nowhere, he's just like, hey, man, I can sing country. And like in broad daylight, right in front, like right outside of this homeless shelter, he just belts out, kind of like singing country music, right? He was really mediocre, but he was really trying. And it was super awkward. So now I think of him as country. And then Slick, I met about two days later. He was just really quiet and dejected looking. Uh, maybe like um, five nine-ish long kind of greasy hair. He more looked like your typical addict, right? So I met both of them and I got my impressions of them and I've just kind of been like noticing what's going on and like behavior. I kind of stay in my room. I'm not up in other people's business, right? But this is the type of thing that I think about myself as a recovering addict here. Um, I look at the people here and I try not to judge them as much, but I do try and like think about them in relation to my own life and where I'm at and uh, where I had to come from and maybe the differences, I guess. You can't help it, right? I'm trying not to do it in a very judgmental way, but in a very real sense, I think if you find yourself in a hard spot and there are others around you in that similar situation, it's very difficult to not kind of look at them and make some comparisons, right? So everything is pretty normal with these two. They're young guys and... Um, you know, I'm in a shelter and I have my own room. There are not many rooms here. It's hard to get one. You got to be on a waiting list. And you got to kind of, you know, have your stuff together. Have your poop in a group a little bit, so to say. So these two are with the majority of people in this shelter. And they're in kind of an open housing, open bunk situation. It's pretty rough, right? We're talking like transitional housing type of thing. It's pretty rough. It's not an easy thing to go through. And... Generally, the people who are there stay there until they leave the house, right? There are not many rooms. It is hard to get a room. So Slick, you never see him, right? He's like your typical addict type. I'm thinking, okay, Slick's probably sleeping a lot in that public area trying to get some sleep in, right? People talk and stuff. <laughs> I couldn't. Man, it's hard to survive in a... Whew, it's hard to survive in a spot like that. And this other guy, Country, he's kind of out and about talking to the workers in the day but i see him less and less right less and less frequently well it's because country and slick start hanging out and it 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 starts to add up like two days ago um i'm coming back i was very frustrated so i took a bike ride at midnight and um i come back and slick's outside he can't get in because you know he doesn't have his own room he doesn't have keys to the building he not supposed to leave. I'm not going to say anything. It's not my place. But he needs to be let back in. And of course, as young addicts who aren't too bright do, he's just talking too much and saying things he shouldn't say, right? It's just me with him, but still, dude, like, he's just saying, like, oh man, I went out to get something for me and country, and he's like supposed to open the door for me, and like, what the hell, man? You know, I'm just thinking, like, God, well, you shouldn't be telling me this shit, boy. <laughs> come on bro <laughs> but it just kind of like hit me that both of these young kids probably like country like i said is 20 21 this other kid 22 maybe maybe just an older looking 19 year old even though he's littler maybe it's just like the drugs and stuff in him but they're already using you know what i mean they're already in this they're already in this situation with like open bunks and stuff and they're probably scoring for other people and stuff it's just like Man, you two kids were on the street, and you got to the shelter. You're going to get kicked out, and the shelters are bad for some people, but, you know, I just see it coming. They're going to pick up this mentality of, ah, oh, shelters, they screw you over. you got to avoid them, and then they're going to fall into that street homeless gutter pit that you never, you almost can never climb back out of that one, right? Don't end up street homeless. That shit, that's scary. That'll get you. So what kind of got me thinking about all this and paying attention to him is the whole thing I'm going through with the VA. Um, I want to say nice things about the VA, Veterans Affairs. I hate them. <laughs> I hate them. I'm working with them again after a long time, and basically they say they can get me some financial assistance, but I need to quit my job. 
They're like, you have an income and that's a problem. Uh, we're not going to be able to help you out that much if you have an income, man. I'm like, hey, I live in a homeless shelter. It shouldn't matter that I got a job, right? Like, I need to save up. I need a car and I need to pay some bills. And they're just like, no, that's, that's not how you do this. If you apply for social programs, you need to be broke. And that's just the truth. That's what they told me. I'm not proud that I actually quit my job. And now it's been like a week and a half. Anyway, just waiting for him to call me back, right? And it feels bad. I'm, I'm getting somewhere with this story. I'm going to connect these two stories. It feels bad, you know? So I quit my job. I only have so many minutes on my phone. I, I you know, I my internet's paid up for this month. But next month, the month after, like, you know, I, I need something to happen here, VA. And it's been a week and a half. And, like, they haven't called me or emailed me back yet. Like, nothing. I've emailed them several times, and it's like, hey, your representative went out to a meeting. There's no one else. Some conference somewhere, and it's like, no one else can talk to you. You just got to wait. You just got to hold what you got. And it's like, well, shit, <laughs> that's not a comfortable spot to be in, man. I hope, I would just wish you, <laughs> people would just talk to me. <laughs> Let me know what's going on. I'm getting freaked out over here. But I was... I was pretty gloom and doom. I was pretty paranoid. And, you know, it's just, it's a risky spot to be in that they've asked me to be in so I can get this assistance. Um, but it got me thinking about these two, you know. Uh, homelessness and shelters, you know, there's a concept in society, like a revolving door, right? Like if a place hires people and fires them very frequently, like any type of mick job, it's a, it's a revolving door job or something like that, right? This place, like a turnover rate. A turnover rate. This place is a huge turnover rate. And it sucks to see, like, two young kids show up here and just show all the signs of getting turned over. You know, not in any bad jail type way, but, like, they're, they're going to be out of here. You know what I mean, man? I'm not going to say anything. I, I'd never kick somebody as they're trying to climb their own ladder. But you just see it again and again and again and again and again. You know, you're, you're scoring for people in a common area and they can't sleep. And you don't know, everyone's listening, man. Everyone's listening. And like me as one of these people in the rooms, you know, I'm, I'm learning about your shit. I shouldn't know anything about it, you know? So like everybody must know about it. But if you guys are out here scoring for other people, it's just like, it's a matter of time until you're done. And then you're going to be out on the street. What are you going to have? You know, I know you guys don't have phones. I, I don't know. If maybe it's just they're so young, but I don't know if a lot of people can really comprehend um, how screwed you are if you don't have a car, you don't have a phone, you don't have a bank account of any type, you don't have any income, no money, and you're homeless. That is like, that is beyond terrifying. That is the worst spot to be in. That is like, that is bad. That is bad news bears, and, like, you are risking all of it. You're risking all of your biscuit, dude. And I guess it was just, like, <clears throat> working with a VA, it's been pretty hard and stressful. I don't like it. I don't like the process of it. I don't like how they communicate, if at all, um, the amount of help you get, what they ask you to do. But then I just, you know, I, I look at the revolving door of the shelter, and you see some, like, 20 year old and yeah he was weird to try and sing outside and you might have a little bit of trauma and a little brain damage he was trying to connect right he was trying to connect and there's nothing wrong with it but it's just like it's it's still like a bright young guy you know who both of them they have good potential and they're just so screwed you know and it's just it's hard to see kids like that it, it almost makes me really grateful you know, really grateful for the Army. Not the VA, but, like, just that structure to fall back on, you know? Like, if I go so long without working, I feel morally, like, bad. And that's probably not a healthy way to be, but I do, you know? It's this kind of, like, drive and structure in me where if I'm not... If my life isn't mirroring the set of standards, you know, no matter how impossible it is to fit these standards as an addict... I'll, I'll really beat myself up, you know, and I can only take that for so many days in a row before I'm like, okay, I'm back up, I'm back at it, uh, you know, I'm not sleeping in it anymore, that was a big mistake. It, it kind of allows me to do these things that a lot of these other guys can't, like have a phone, keep a driver's license, 
not get fired every two weeks. And it's not that I'm saying I'm better, man. It makes me feel really awful. You know, um, I'm not trying to say like, oh, like a homeless veteran is, but it makes me really grateful that I guess like I have some system of support and also some expectations of myself, you know, some structure to fall back on, man something you know i i'm not i I don't let myself get put in these spots like that and also like they're just young so i don't want to judge them too much when i was young i was stupid you know i was if i had never joined the army when i was young i i don't know man i don't know but it has me feeling a little grateful i guess and that's kind of a sad thing to feel grateful about your own life watching two young guys who are just screwed like, they're, they're going to get used up, man. People are going to take their money. They're going to convince them to go score for them. They're going to take the fall. They're going to end up homeless again. And that same thing that repeats, you're going to have one of these old dirty shelter bastards, you know, keeping their bunk bed while they just screw over these two young guys. And it just, it's an ugly part of shelter culture, I guess. I know that's probably surprising. You're thinking, what, score drugs in the shelter? Anyone who knows anything about shelter life, go ahead and comment below. Shelters are full of drugs. <laughs> like, if you want to stay sober, you don't, you don't want to end up in a shelter, buddy. That's, that's rough right there. <laughs> that is rough because they're all of the drugs in a shelter at any given time. I don't know how. I don't know why. It just is what it is, man. It is what it is. Half of these denizens are just out with their bus passes for all of the daylight hours trying to score something and bring it back for some reason, you know? But, um, yeah, in a grim way that has me feeling a little bit better about myself. At least I'm just that much more put together. And some, and, like, I worry about smooth brain. I worry about, like, big brain damage from meth. My eyes aren't focused, you know, I've been sober again for coming up on five months. I worry that I have, like, early onset dementia or something, you know? Like, I can tell I'm not mentally all there. I'm slurring my words a lot less, but I'll still drop things that I shouldn't drop and bump into shit. <laughs> like, my coordination will just get randomly screwed. And if I get flustered, like, I can't hold a thought, you know? Like, I cannot let myself get flustered or frustrated. If I do, it's like, it's a cascading effect until I'm just like, duh. <laughs> I'll just bump into everything and slur every word. It's like, it's crazy. It's crazy to be like that, and it makes you, it makes me scared. You know, it makes me scared that, like, I'll get sober, but I'll never recover these mental faculties, and I, I probably won't. You know, it's probably something you adapt to. But um, watching two young guys who kind of have it all in front of them, but just have no chance, on one hand, it makes my stomach feel like knots and pits and really ugly, and on the other hand, I just think, Thank God I'm not them.